Hi, my name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Thanks for once again joining us for Virtual Wednesdays. During tonight's conversation, you'll hear from a panel of speakers from FAMSF's Creative Notions blog series, inspired by the work of Patrick Kelly. This panel features artists that knew Patrick Kelly, worked with him, and studied with him at Parsons. Tonight's conversation presents an exciting opportunity to learn more about how Patrick Kelly's legacy continues to inspire artists today. To share more about our moderator, Keyblade Chase Marshall cut his professional teeth as an apparel designer working within the studios of some of 7th Avenue's most influential brands, including Michael Kors, Isaac Mizrahi, and Gap, before carving out a space in the editorial community as a contributing writer and market editor at Town & Country, Paper Magazine, and L.com. Since 2018, he has diligently operated as an equity advocate, most re recently co-founding the Kelly Initiative, a four-point industry-evolving plan to increase access to opportunities for Black fashion professionals. Thank you so much for joining us once again. And of course, thank you for joining me and welcoming tonight's speakers. Good afternoon on the West Coast. Good evening on the East Coast. I am Keyboy Chase Marshall. I am one of the co-founders and the executive director of the Kelly Initiative, an organization dedicated to forging equitable inroads for fashion's Black talent. And I am joining you today with some great panelists to discuss uh, the Creative Notions collaboration between the Kelly Initiative and the De Young Museum. It's been a really dynamic and unique experience to have a coterie of illustrators and designers share their talent as they commemorate the amazing work of designer Patrick Kelly that is currently on display at the De Young Museum. I am going to be chatting today with this crew of illustrators and designers about how dynamically a role uh, illustration plays in the design process. I'm going to introduce them first one by one and tell you a little bit about their uh, paths thus far professionally and creatively. First up, we have Shauna McGee, who is a Parsons alum of an extremely talented apparel designer uh, who's worked on 7th Avenue for quite some time, but in her newest chapter is helming her own brand out of the burgeoning style community in Detroit. Hi, Shauna. Hi, how are you? Thank I'm you for great. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, Shauna will share some really exciting, uh, unique personal experiences that she has had with uh, Patrick Kelly um, during her uh, academic time at Parsons. Um, continuing uh, to carry the Parsons torch, our next panelist is Julian Guthrie, who is a uh, multi-hyphenate uh, extraordinaire. He is a designer, a pattern maker, an illustrator, and currently he is sort of like carving a new territory in digital design aided by 3D uh, graphic software called Clove 3D. Uh, Julian, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me, Keepway. So excited to chat with you about the exciting things you're doing and teaching at Parsons. And finally, we have Charles Alexander, who is among the most <laughs> dynamic uh, Black designers uh, working on 7th Avenue. Charles, before terms like diversity and inclusion were part of the mainstream dialogue, was able to get his collection stocked at some of the most influential retailers in New York. He continues mm. to work both as a designer, but more uh, recently has really leaned into his talent as a uh, super, super, super distinguished fashion illustrator. Charles, we're thrilled to have you today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> um, you all, I am so excited to sort of talk shop um, in a very public forum, um, but these are conversations that I have been wanting to have with you all. I'm glad to have it in community now. And I'm really glad to give this audience of the young museum enthusiasts uh, a peek into what we designers chat about. Um, so 
I wanted to talk initially about Patrick Kelly's work, um, but from a unique place, from the place of saying, uh, what, what was illustration like uh, in his process? So I'm gonna pull something up um, and let's just react a little bit to what we're seeing. Anyone jump in and tell me how you've responded to seeing his sketches over the years? Hmm. Well, for me, you know, he's, he's from Parsons, so definitely has like this fun, sort of abstract, humorous feeling to his work, which is very much his personality. You mentioned that he initially came out of Parsons and all three of you did. Can you, uh, can you all talk a little bit to the unique traditions of illustration in the Parsons design program? Tell me, tell those of us who didn't study at Parsons um, a bit about uh, the conventions and the rigor of the illustration pro, uh, component of the program there. Well, Julian, you guys should start because your your professor's there now. <laughs> Julian, <laughs> but I, I I know, like put me on. Well, part of it is like, <laughs> yes, you're right. I am still like, and I'm physically here at the moment. Um, but now it's different than from when I did my undergraduate. Well, tell and us I about when you did your undergrad. I did my undergraduate from 1997 to 2001. And tell um, me about learning illustration at Parsons. Give me some of the nitty gritty about what's really taught as illustration technique, the medium. At you that time. In. Yes. Okay, I mean, I have to very much contextualize it at that time. It, huge influence, big push was wash. It was really, I really felt at that time, your designs were almost really predicated on how well you illustrated, not mm -hmm. it, it wasn't necessarily so much on like the conceptual thinking about what you were actually designing. It really was just like, was it beautifully drawn? If it was beautifully drawn, then it was a beautiful design. Charles, um, can you tell me a little bit about this magical medium called gouache? What is gouache for those who are not design industry native? Well, I mean, gouache is basically a form of watercolor or water paint. It's very difficult to use. It's, it's, it dries quickly sometimes <laughs> or not sometimes. Um, it takes a steady hand. You really have to control the color, the way it's mixed, the way you prep the paper mm -hmm. for it. It's really an art form. And it has such a tradition at Parsons, especially because it gives you this painterly like look mm -hmm. that other mediums just don't do, do, they just don't. Um, and it gives you a hand and an emotion that'll come through the illustration and a life to the work, which is why Parsons was so strict about it because mm -hmm. I mean, definitely Parsons is about getting a job. So. Yeah. If you were a Parsons student and you were in the top five, that means you were going to at some point control American fashion. So they, if you look at all the designers from that period, they all are incredible illustrators. And it's because of Parsons and the method that they taught you of how to do it. And they just beat it into you, so to speak. <laughs> but they Shana, it, would you call it the Motown? Motown records of American design then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. you couldn't even, you couldn't even get a job on 7th Avenue. Well, you could get a job, but if you want to be at a design house, mm -hmm. you have to know how to illustrate. And so were you taught to just begin using gouache on the paper or were you sketching before and then gouache became how you finish the illustration, walk people who aren't illustrators through some of the one, two, three, four, five steps of the, the croaky illustration process that you were taught. So you start off with just doing your pencil drawing and then you would just paint with gouache. I, I could do watercolor as well. So it was either paint or watercolor. We were never allowed to use markers. You could not use markers. It was so you 
you had to use paint and you could use pencil for shading or chalk for shading. But that was uh, what we were taught because the, the standard was Michael Vobrek. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Of Parsons. And the standard and his paintings were hanging all throughout the school. So that was like the standard of where they wanted us to be. And, and Michael Volbrick was a designer who at the time was teaching at Parsons? No, he's a, no, he, was no. a well, he went to Parsons. He's a well-known uh, illustrator and fashion designer. And his, his work was hanging throughout the school. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was the standard really of uh, between him and Stippleman and uh, Kenneth Paul Block at the time, Stephen Mizell before he even started becoming a photographer. That was the standard of where they wanted us to be as illustrators. And so Wonderful. we all- So I, I, want to, I, want to, uh, I want to give info about some of those people you named to our audience in bite-sized nuggets. So we'll circle back to those names. I know probably among the three of us, those names are as, uh, you know, identifiable as, you know, top 10 recording artists or movie mm -hmm. stars. But uh, we'll circle back for our audience to some of those names because um, I think that the role that they've played in inspiring illustrators is really exciting to share. Um, something that I think is kind of fascinating to note about Patrick Kelly's relationship with illustration is that it was part of his design process as you see here in some of his sketches mm -hmm. for clothing that he created, but it was also something that he built into some of the advertising and promotion of his brand. So this is an image of a Christopher Hill sort of paper, collaged, illustration invitation that Patrick Kelly used um, for one of his uh, apparel presentations, his collections. Mm -hmm. And consciously or not, it was fascinating for me to note how this image factored a bit in your illustration, Shauna, for the Creative Notions project that is now on the blog of the De Young Museum. And as well, the framing factored in your illustration, Julian, to some degree, there's a sort of gold foil frame. Um, so I think that that's kind of fascinating to note um, that the illustration that can begin in the creating clothing process can sometimes as well be so inspiring to designers in other aspects of the 360 uh, scope of what they do. Um, Julian, one of the things that I was interested in hearing about from the panelists is outside of the, the specific fashion community, what are some creative uh, spaces of inspiration from you, be it fine art or otherwise? Um, I mean, that regard, I would end up saying definitely like just being fine art for me, my kind of creative spaces, I just have to like really raw industrial spaces. So like when I think about like Dumbo, that type of area, mm -hmm. um, you know, power plants like that for me is always just um, an amazing experience. Um, and you had named some specific people as well outside of the fashion space that you found inspiring. No. Yeah, yeah, like, so for me, like, when it comes to, like, non, um, like, fashion illustrators, um, I'm a big fan of Egon Schiele. When I came to Parsons, mm. that was one of the first kind of artists that, that essentially that I was introduced to. And I remember one of my instructors who I would look at, she's like, he, he was doing fashion illustration before there was fashion illustration. If we just looked at, like, that kind of line quality and these very, part of it was also these kind of, like, gangly, if you will, or emaciated figures, I think was also a part of it. But there was also such a simplicity to also, I think, in how he was- Julian, we're rebranding the industry these days. We're, not... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're no longer celebrating gangly and emaciated. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah, I know. we're troubling it's, 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 that. I, I know, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, I'm full, I'm very, that I am very- aware. You're on board with it. Um, okay, good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, Charles, what are some unique spaces of inspiration outside of the traditional fashion illustration community for you? 
people or, or spaces? Oh, there's been so many over the years. I think that's one of the best parts about fashion in general, that it's a reflection of the times and a reflection of what everybody's going through. I mean, I can be, in, I mean, a big inspiration for me color-wise is Helen Frankenthaler. She's an incredible wow, modern yes. artist. And if you look at my work, you can see the soft, washy palettes and all that. And I was just exposed to her at such a young age that I can't deny the, you know, impact she had on me. Um, but I can also look at somebody's furniture, like Billy Haynes furniture, and the chicness of that and the layout and the color choices that are like Helen's and just the graphic position of where things are in the room also inspires me as well. So yeah, everything that, you know, everything that's in front of you, you have to be very careful, I think, as an artist, especially <laughs> in fashion, because you will absorb it. <laughs> mm. you, you, a teacher told me that at Parsons and they're like be careful what you look at because it will affect well, you, you, and you, you, won't said, it. you said the four letter word that I think probably all of us uh, can't get enough of which is chic and so um, yeah. I think that leaning into that which one sort of sees as embodying that alchemy of chic is what I think a lot of illustrators gravitate toward what mm. I want to do now is give our audience a little bit of a peek beyond the illustrations that you all did as part of the Creative Notions collaboration into your portfolios and some of your other work. Um, Shauna, I'm gonna start with you, hold one moment. So can you tell us a little bit about your process working. Do you sketch from photos? Do you sketch from live models? Do you do prelim sketches? Take us through your process. Well, each one is, you know, it depends on my mood. So um, sometimes like that one there, that's Christopher John Rogers. If they're, if the on the, on the right? On the right with the striped skirt. Okay. Uh, and so, here we go. I want to make sure we throw, we, we give people context for names. So tell us who is Christopher John Rogers? So Christopher John Rogers is this young black designer out of New York. Um, and he's new to the scene and he's really doing an amazing job. And I love what he's doing at all with all of his bright colors and mm -hmm. he's everything. Really, he's really taken off within the last uh, year gotten a lot of support. He's he's an alum of DVF's design studio, right? And has really been able to make a transition from working in a design studio to helming his own brand in a way that few are. Definitely having a, a huge moment currently. Right. So when I see the collections, I always look at the collections. So he's always one that I look at. And whenever I see something from the collections, I just like to paint it. And that was something that, that I loved from him. And I just painted because I don't like necessarily doing only my designs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just want to free my mind from thinking about the paint. Like, what is the dress going? Because I design the dresses. Whenever you see something in mine, I design the clothes. I do the background. I design the hair, the scarves, everything. So in the so illustration on the right, did you sketch from a photograph? Did you come up with the pose, compose the pose yourself? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Which one are you calling on the right? I only see two on the screen, I see. So the, the one that's on the right side of this, oh, maybe on your phone it's stacked. So the Christopher John Rogers one. Right, so the Christopher John Rogers one, um, that, like I said, that's a, from one of his collections a few seasons ago. Was the pose from a photo or did yeah. you? Yeah, it's, okay. it's from his runway show. The, Got you know, it. That Vogue.com releases mm -hmm. is from those uh, pictures. He has- So this is from the lookbook image. Yeah, that they posted- As you interpret it as a sketch. Right, whereas opposed to the one on the left, which is my original, is- one of my scarves that I just pr pr uh, sketched in the background and everything. And I was inspired by Africa. And um, I was just in the mood to just escape. That's what happens with a lot of these pictures that I, paintings that I do. I and love that. Um, I'm, 
I, I just want to escape. So I escaped through the paintings. Uh, so these two, uh, Julian and Charles, clock the, the, the tiered uh, mm -hmm. ruffle technique here. <laughs> I told Shana when she submitted the sketch on the right for the Creative Notions uh, project that the first thing my eye went to was the technique of rendering uh, there, the, the ruffle. Um, oh, the <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the sketch for our audience on the right is part of the gallery of sketches that comprise the Creative Notions collaboration. Um, and this really pulls in uh, Shauna's knowledge of and love for Patrick Kelly. Tell us about that sketch, Shauna. Well, you know, Patrick is always doing all these images of like the Black Mirror Mobilia or the Eiffel Tower or whatever. And I said, you know what? He's always um, amplifying that or whatever. I said, he needs to be amplified. He needs to, his face, his, his image. I think needs to be on clothing. And that's why I put his painting on the dress. So I love that notion that Patrick Kelly centralized icons, geographic and cultural in his work. So in your honoring of him, you centralized him as an icon. Right, he's an icon. So, you know. Very cool. Yeah. He, Very he, cool. He, and then the sketch on the left with this gorgeous figure from the back with face and profile. Um, tell me about the garment and the technique here, because I feel like we have a, a mixture of media here. Well, it's just like, it's all gouache. Oh, okay. And it's Carolina Herrera. And um, it was a runway shot and I just added the blocking in the back and whatever, but is is squat and pencil. That's it. Super beautiful. That okay. that combination of that sort of you know soft sky blue within the vibrant red is is pretty magic. That's Thanks. that's very very amazing. Um, I'm going to hop to uh, Julian next, who. Uh, is going to talk in multiple directions because he's such a Renaissance creative. So you're going to see initially <laughs> some of his uh, printmaking, and then you'll see um, the, um, the sketch he created for the Creative Notions collaboration, which will show you some of this dynamic 3D digital work he's doing. So one moment, I'm just going to share his work. So Julian, um, I love that this sort of is engaging process a bit to talk to me about uh, these images and your technique and, and uh, the resulting work. Um, the funny thing is I don't think I can, in this regard, almost can do anything kind of like just, I would say a little more simple. I always kind of have multiple layers of things that I mm. like to work with. Um, so definitely here, this is clearly like a mixed form of media because I was working with silk screen, silk screens. And then, uh, like the one image on the right where it's actually, that is silk screened onto sandpaper. So wow. that was also when I start thinking about just the tactile experience of artwork. Um, and then the one on the left, um, pardon me audience at home as I push my eyes into my screen <laughs> to see the details. <laughs> um, then the other one on the left um, was sometimes, I also have just this thing with like masking tape. Uh -huh. So I just literally took like, you know, one of those like hanging folders that like, you know, are in a drawer and just like ripped it apart and then just threw some tape on it. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be the, you know, my material that I am going to silk screen onto. So it's part of it for me is just be like exploring different materiality of things. Um, and is this is this footwear in profile? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I that's what I saw initially, 
but didn't know if that was just my obsession with footwear being projected onto any and everything in life in general. Um, but I love it. It reminds me of an illustrator by the name of Francois Bertou, who used to do illustrations for Interview Magazine of the collections each season and often would like pick an accessory and do this very sort of like elevated, I wouldn't quite call it an abstraction because often it is truly, uh, it is, it adheres to the integrity of the silhouette of the object or accessory, but then adds things like you do of like print and the, you know, the, yeah, you, you got me here because there's kind of like a cool Rorschach test with the mirroring of the print. Um, it's really exciting to see you, you know, begin with the fashion language, but not feel obligated to end there. Um, mm -hmm. On the right side here, uh, audience at home, you can see uh, Julian's contribution to the collaboration. Uh, Julian, walk us through um, two things. First, briefly tell us um, a little bit about the digital program that you teach at Parsons that you use for the figure here. Tell us a little bit about that first. So the program that I'm using is Clothe 3D. So it's a virtual fashion design um, program and pattern making program. And so basically it allows you to create in three dimensions. So you can see the avatar has a huge amount of like custom abilities and things that you can do within that, just within the program let alone if you start exploring other, you know, working with Photoshop and bringing elements into Photoshop into it, Illustrator, other 3D programs like Daz 3D, you know, I feel like it just kind of goes on and on and on. And um, this program is something that is being adopted by the industry. Tell us some of the reasons why the industry is beginning to really embrace this digital 3D design and illustration software. Um, basically, if you're concerned from a sustainability point of view, you can definitely cut down on terms of material material consumption. Because um, we all know how we waste a sample in a studio. <laughs> you know, that sleeve um, is an inch too long. New sample. The sleeve is now an inch too short. New sample. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's that. Yeah, that. <laughs> and then just the reality of like how quick one can see the possibility of what it actually looks like. And it also helps in terms of just the visual communication. Mm. Of, um, you know, once you have the 3D of that garment, because effectively you're also making the pattern in the program simultaneously. So then that's something that can then be, you know, essentially printed out, given to the factory. And so then you can also work from and I, wanted, I want to make sure that the audience of viewers really understands how dynamic and revolutionary that is. This software is allowing someone to illustrate garments onto a figure and then developing the directions in terms of the way to cut fabric to create that garment in real life for a sewer. It's doing uh, the translation of the sketch into a usable clothing sewing pattern. And that is potentially for many people, a step that financially they weren't able to easily make, or in terms of the time, uh, getting that translation from the sketch to the pattern to cut a garment uh, was very challenging. Um, now, Julian, quickly tell us a little bit about this rich language of visual that you've created in your illustration. What's going on here? Okay, so similar to Shauna and this, I also wanted to like celebrate, you know, Patrick Kelly. So I decided like, okay, I'm just going to literally put his image in the image. And mm. I also like saw the repetition and of how he was using the frame. So that's how what I decided to also pull from. Um, also in doing this, I was kind of channeling again, like, the different you know artists that I also happen to like in different ways and thinking how they work with media. Um, I mean, not you know, in this regard, it's not like full on Macaline Thomas, but I happen to really like what she does. So there was elements where I literally just picked out like I found a frame at home that was beaten up, and I'm like, all right, I have some gold foil. I'm just gonna gold foil it. Um, so I'll toss. Uh, I will toss for our audience. Uh, 
Micheline Thomas, a really dynamic multimedia contemporary artist. Uh, and it's fascinating for Julian to share that. I hadn't, I don't know if I caught that the last time we spoke about your work. Now that you mention how Micheline Thomas was floating through your head, um, it's that rich, it's that much more rich to me how, you know, this language is informed by this really cool hybrid of, of influences. Um, Charles, I want to chat with you because mm -hmm. if, you know, if, if, if I'm thrilled to have Julian really reaching toward the, the technological future mm -hmm. of illustration, I love that you continue to sort of pull the legacy of some <laughs> of the, the like conventions of fashion illustration. I'm going to share now some of your work with our audience at home. And we will chat about that one moment. So talk to me about the media that you work in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll, we'll, I mean, we gotta, we gotta take this in bite sizes here. Uh, talk about the media you work in and then we'll talk about your figures, et cetera. But first let's just, what do you make this, the, these illustrations out of? Well, these are both gouache illustrations and they're both very classic Parsons. Um, well, deceptively classic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a little bit of marker and a little bit of um, colored pencil in there. Um, it's very classic illustration materials, mm -hmm. but, but it, I like that juxtaposition like you were just talking about of taking something from the past and then using it on something that's really modern. And mm -hmm. for today, I think those two things can both exist at the same time. Um, I love that we got a new derriere into this Zoom. That's always a plus. <laughs> and generally a subvert goal of mine. Um, well, my, my thing was with the, the illustration on the left, which is the Alexander McQueen, mm -hmm. that's from Sarah Burton. That collection was spectacular. And so I had to draw it the second I saw it. And, and I was looking through Instagram and there's literally an endless sea of male nude bodies. Mm. And so I, what was really great to me was like, normally what I would have to book a model and take pictures to get those images. I simply found a guy that I liked on Instagram, downloaded all his pictures, clipped out the body parts that I like. And this is actually part of a six part series. And it, throughout the series, if you line them all up, the outfit changes and the bodies change and undulate up and down. And it's that's a very, I think, it's not an obvious juxtaposition, but it obviously visually is so harmonious. And yeah. I mean, you know, I think illustrators, if they're doing their job, especially when they're illustrating other people's apparel, they're tapping some of the sensibility of the designer um, yeah. and that edge and that provocation, it could not be more McQueen. Um, well, especially with, with what Sarah's doing, because I really wanted to bring out the masculine, feminine, punk rockness of that collection hmm. and the nudity with the like virginity and all of that, those, you know, yin and yang push and pull things that she was doing. And then to take it as if it was a graphic ad that she would use in a magazine that you would see. Well, I want to see an animated Dua Lipa video with this <laughs> illustration. I think that her people need to get on the phone with you pronto. Tell, okay. us, uh, tell us about the illustration on the right. The illustration on my right is one of my favorite things to do because to me, they're very psychological because mm. you have the figure that's kind of all washy and then you have the very, very detailed flats. So, and I always think to myself, it's like, a lot of times when you're in design rooms or working with people, that people are comfortable one way or the other. They want something really, really detailed and that doesn't bother, scare them or bother them. Or they want something, you know, washed out or they want something really detailed in the figure. And it, it's interesting if you look at this and just think about flipping it. What if the flats were all washy and what if the figure was really detailed? Mm. And if, especially when you get to the boots, because it's like, you know, 
would you know that those boots look like that if you didn't see the flat? So is this your own design work? It is my own design work, but I purposely do those things sometimes within my work. Yeah, I think that this illustration embodies a, a component of fashion illustration mm -hmm. that I think some people never arrive at, which is the power of suggestion that can yeah. be so much at times more compelling than drawing mm -hmm. it straight out. So mm -hmm. in when I look and for my eye, it looks that, like you took a brush and just did the boot on the figure like I did and that. <laughs> You know, it just is so compelling in how it suggests the rhythm of the folds of that boot or the, 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 mm -hmm. the embellishment. Um, and then the other thing that you're doing here that real illustration enthusiasts become so sort of fastidious about figuring new techniques is rendering in some way translucency or transparency of fabric um, mm -hmm. you all could maybe, ch you know, the many techniques that yeah. you study at Parsons mm -hmm. in regard to illustrating things like transparency and, and as opposed to translucency, as opposed to iridescence, yeah. as opposed to, um, and to see, uh, some of that here, um, is, is beautiful. Um, your illustration on the left um, mm -hmm. for me shows a clear knowledge of and appreciation for the work of Antonio Lopez, who Shauna yeah. mentioned was um, one of her favorite illustrators. Um, everyone here, jump in and share a little bit about who Antonio Lopez was and what he has, uh, what he, how he influenced your illustration. Well, I mean, for me, it was, you know, when you, like Shauna mentioned earlier, Michael Volbrock and Antonio Lopez, those illustrators, as, as you were a child in America, those were the people you saw the most. Those are the mm. people you saw in the advertisements, in the magazines. Those are the people when you were a kid and your parents wouldn't let you go to art school or you couldn't go to art class. And you would take the sketch out and you get a piece of tracing paper and you try and copy them. They were, they were really, if you look at it, for that time period, everyone's first teacher. So I will so, say for the audience uh, viewing that Antonio Lopez was a prolific, a truly mm -hmm. prolific illustrator that really cut his teeth in the very demanding role of being a, an illustrator for periodicals like Women's Wear Daily yep. that demanded a high volume of illustration mm -hmm. that was not for fashion insider people only. Back yep. then, often clothing was sold via illustrations because it was easier and faster to correct than film that mm -hmm. was sent out to process via photography. Um, some people believe that design that illustrators like Antonio Lopez, who got used to illustrating at that pace, that that became Mm -hmm. They never had Skechers block because they, you know, were sitting in a newsroom that they developed a level of being able to generate work freely that allowed their work to go really far. Antonio's work is noted because it spanned across from the 60s through yeah. the early 80s, 80s and his style evolved as the dialogue of contemporary style did. This work here looks in some ways, like the work he was doing, and it, it looks different, but I think it honors in certain ways the work he was doing in the late 60s um, and uh, early 70s. Um, tell me about the, the image on the left. How do you compose these multi-figure images? You, well, that, that image, interesting enough, I did for Ball Harbor Shops. Oh, wow. So they always like to include the koi pond in the structure of the building. Okay. And my thought was to turn it upside down. So the koi pond is on the ceiling and the girls are walking on the clouds in the sun. So Beautiful. that was my first standpoint with that. With, with, when you're taking three figures like that and all of that 
visual information, it's really important to group it all together. Like the girl, the, the palm leaves are intertwined through them. The girls are touching each other. It's like, there has to be, you kind of learn that I did anyway from magazines as a kid because mm. you you learn layout it's like mm-hmm. you know i went to um tawny goodman's you know book signing and i you know practically got on my knees and thanked the woman because she taught me so much about layout tawny this- goodman for the audience is one of the most celebrated stylists for american yeah. vogue and it's really you know i couldn't have done something like this without those kind of influences from magazines and editors because this is very very editorial it is it is about it the image is much about the painting and the expertise is about the layout without the layout you don't have anything there's also a in keeping with that a fascinating play with surrealism here of you yes. Um, blurring our distinction of what is foreground and background Mm -hmm. and sort of weaving the two um, hallucinogenically. And then we're upside down. It's fascinating. I never want to leave, but I do want to, (laughs) I do want to chat about the sketch that you created for the collaboration Uh, honoring Patrick Kelly, and that sketch is on the right. Tell us a bit about the garments you designed here and then about the sketch that you created. Well, one of the first things Patrick did advertising in America was he made these postcards of the advertising campaign. And the advertising campaign was groups of girls and him standing in the middle. And so I took that and, you know, did a very, you know, basic Parsons croaky swatch took the buttons, made them into little discs as a background, put his name going through it, and then took the figures. I was really kind of like, you know, both Julian and Shauna did. I took the iconic, you know, his graphic logo that he used all the time, and I just broke it apart. So you see the colors in the shoes, the hat, you have the classic zebra print, but it's with stripes, it's the different color plays. I just mixed it all together and wanted to come up with something, you know, if Patrick was here, what might he do? And that's why you even have the dreadlocks that have the colors coming out at the end. You know, just life and love and what he loved. I am going to quickly uh, transition to asking you all, I believe a question that we received from the audience, um, and that is, how did your participation in the Creative Notions uh, series enrich uh, some of the work you're doing creatively right now, your practice in general? So thinking about Patrick at this moment right now, how does that enrich your practice? Well, for me, you know, I knew Patrick from school. He was my classmate and friend. So he himself has inspired me in the sense that he was like, no matter what, I'm going to do this. You know, uh, he did. He wasn't happy with school. So he said, I'm going to Paris. He went to Paris. And next thing you know, he had his collection. So that inspires me every day. Wonderful. Julian and Charles weigh in. I think I get so much from him from just the you know, joie de vivre of his work, of, you know, the joy and the life and the passion, the dedication, the true love of women that you can see in the work. You can see the, you know, women bought his clothes head to toe. It was head to toe dressing. They wanted it. They wanted to know what shoe went with that because I want that too. You know, it was, he just thought of it in such a beautiful way and that definitely inspires everything I do. Julian, that that's so true, Charles. Julian, do you care to toss in how working on this project and creating the illustration you did honoring Patrick Kelly has in some way impacted your practice. So now I feel like I'm going to be like the Debbie Downer of the, of the day. Like <laughs> it's not that it hasn't, it's not that it hasn't impacted me. It was actually really looking at his work. And part of it is because of things like the gollywog for me was actually a very uncomfortable situation. So for me, it was more just, I actually, 
my mind kind of went to just other places just about like race representation and how I felt about those things. Mm -hmm. um, I did in that regard, it ended up being a little, I did at some point in time just try to separate that and just like, okay, well, what do I kind of just see as motifs and just in that regard, I kind of went in it a little more just kind of objectively, but I know that was part of the main thing for me that I still kind of- It's a fascinating element me. of encountering Mr. Kelly's work that everyone has a unique relationship with. Um, his depictions of race via sometimes a lens of wit, irony, reclaiming trauma. Uh, it, it, all of us, as those who have walked through America in black skin, uh, we have unique individual experiences with. I want to thank you all so much for sharing this unique experience with <laughs> myself thank and you. our audience of viewers today. I want to thank the De Young Museum and especially curator Laura Carmelingo for the invitation to collaborate. Uh, and I also want to thank the community of Kelly Initiative supporters who remain in dedication to forging equitable inroads for fashion's Black talent. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.